same exact questions, the same exact answer. Right, because I picked the book that's default language is Java. Yeah. That's the book I picked. But, uh, I mean, as you see what I do in, in, well, I've done it in this class, I do it in a lot of classes, I show you other languages. Um, I, I how they're got, all equivalent. I just got tired of answering the answers. <clears throat> <copy, copy, laughs> See, he doesn't like repetition either. Okay. Well, help me understand that. So, uh, I don't think it helps you when you're immediately repeating it. Like, just the moment. Well, what do you mean by usability? So, is it that it's too slow? Like on your machine, or is it um, that you just don't think it's a well put together tool? I'm sure it's put together. It's, I just had a whole lot of technical. Okay, uh, but now you have it working, right? Mostly. Okay. So, so help me understand better your 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 struggles. <laughs> That's a lot to think about. It's, like, it's just that bad. Yeah. Is it slowness? Yeah. Okay. So slowness is related to computer, right? Is it uh, slow down there? It's not. I don't know if it's necessarily slow down there, but I haven't gotten it to work down there either. Okay. What what part doesn't work? Buttons. So, so like yeah. ru running it on the simulator or designing the interface? Okay, when you go to how, when you say it doesn't work, how does when I click on the design tab, there's nothing there. Nothing shows up. All right, I'll check Android Studio uh, down there after class today. Um, it is the having most updated version. I can check that. Okay. Um, so basically what you're saying is what you see me doing in class and what your experience is is a little bit different. Like when I click the tab, the design thing pops up. And when you go down there, that's not happening. Right. Okay. I don't remember the last time I put anything in. Well, I, I had it where it was working and then it just, like, near the, when I was finishing up and had to have a sign thing, it just crashed. Okay. Before I could finish. And your design's working fine on yours? Yeah, mine don't. Like, sometimes when I run an opera crash, it just won't do the screen. Then it's only doing it on the button. Design's working fine on yours, and you're running on Windows, right? No, I'm on Linux. Oh, you're running on Linux, you're running on Mac. Yeah. You on the Windows or the Mac side down there? Windows side. Windows. Windows. And you're on a Mac. Oh, you use it on Windows? Do you have problems with it, or so? Always said, can find the SDK on my Mac. You gotta download this. Well, so the pattern I'm seeing here is it seems like we have the Windows folks that I are. Have Windows on my PC and all that. Yeah, I run there. Oh, and you run it on there, it's fine. Yeah, I have it on my PC. And no, no issues. I've only used it once. And it, was it was fine. I mean, it should be the same tool. I mean, because really, Android Studio is actually, well, up here, do you like Eclipse? So, I, I, that was a loaded question. Android Studio is, is Eclipse. So, in the early days of Android development, there was a plug-in for Eclipse. And since Eclipse is open source, Google took, Android, took Eclipse and built the Android SDK into it and called it Android Studio. And gave it a little facelift for, you know, colors and stuff. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was pretty when it's not working. It's good when it's working, but when it's not working, it's just frustrating. It's all jet brains. They're all, they're inconsistent. It's a little bit slowly, but I like The first half of the new morning. I use for c I use, you know, for the, for Python, the, I don't know what it's called, Python 1. Okay. And for C sharp. I just use all the tools. Well, that, the C sharp one's mono, right? No, no, no. Mono is the one that comes with Unity, right? Uh, well, no, mono does come with Unity, but Unity has nothing to do with Unity. Okay. Mono is its own mono is ID. Mono is the, like, the equivalent of .NET in Linux, right? 
their implementation of it, but they have they have an Eclipse based uh, IDE for yeah, for that. It's called Char. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Well, I'll ch I'm going to check Android Studio down there in the lab because I mean you the, you shouldn't have those issues. I mean there shouldn't be a um, like I guess it it uh, concerns me that you haven't been able to work on interfaces at all. That that shouldn't be the way it is. Um, so I'm gonna I'll I'll check that. I want to know what the. Okay, so I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to check that. I'm going to suspect that that's probably a truth. Then what I'll do is I'm going to create uh, for the back by four machines. I'll get, put the I'll put on Slack the machine numbers. I'm going to create an admin based. Uh, well, have you tried logging in with admin? Because you have the admin account for those, right? Yeah. Have you tried that? I think I I don't know if I logged in with the account, but like I logged in with my account and then I tried checking it with Okay. So I'll test it both ways, but what I'll do is I'll create a um, developer account on like the back four machines. I'll put the machine numbers on there and give you the password for it so that you can log in and it'll be a, a administrator account that you can then have access to the stuff um, that you might need if, if something like that is the limiting factor. All right. So... <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is what it is, but I mean, it's, uh, you know, this is the industry standard tool for writing Android applications. So, what's this good? Uh, so, like, another thing, like, I have a thing with Git, and so the other thing is with Git, or Git, I forget what it's called. Oh, with Git? I don't know, like, having an integration with... MVC. MVC. Um, like, having that and doing both of those, but, like, if we're trying to learn Like a programmer to be using like Eclipse or whatever else in like Java to like understand the common stuff, and then adding that um, interface to it on top of it because we're like I don't know trying to do it all at once. Yeah, so I mean the issue would be that any way you cut it, you're going to have an interface. So if you do it in uh, uh, Eclipse, let's say, then you're going to have a stupid text looking text based interface. Um, if you do it in Android, you're going to have call it a, a prettier interface where you're using stuff that's more related to what you might be doing in industry, where you're going to have graphic user interface um, things. I'm not sure one of those is more difficult than the other, other than the fact that you're having problems with Android Studio. Um, so, I mean, it'd be one thing if building the interfaces was a really, really complex, uh, complex thing, but where I think we're just building just functional like here's a couple of buttons, click the button, make it do something. It's not like a super difficult interface that we're trying to uh, design. So at the end of the day, it might be a 50-50 split between what's, uh, you know, what is more difficult, the interface on uh, the text, stupid text-based interface versus at least a functional graphical user interface that is giving you practice on what you might do in industry. That's probably at least a toss-up where the stuff behind the Java part is identical. So I don't know if it's all that compelling to, like, I don't know that you're gaining that much by doing it a little bit in Eclipse first and then coming over to Android Studio, um, except that you wouldn't have to deal with the interface builder. Um, so if, assuming the interface builder was working, I don't know that that's like a problem. You know, obviously, if it's not working, then you could have made it work with a text-based interface in, uh, um, in Eclipse, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that would be my feeling on that. I don't know. I mean, is, is building an interface in Android really substantially more difficult than building like a text-based menu? Uh, yeah, I just, I just. Well, yeah, I mean, that's if you try to make a fancy uh, text-based interface. <laughs> I'm talking about like a little menu system. You like press one for add front, press two for add end. I mean, that's gonna, it would be just, I don't know, just kind of. The layout of Android is a little annoying. Because we 
Just getting used to the layout. Yeah. Yeah, but really, the, so many different uh, interface builders out there are really work the exact same way Android works with the linear layouts and stuff like that, where, I mean, having practice with that, even though it's kind of annoying, uh, I mean, is going to make it so that you already know a bunch of other tools because you know this tool. So, uh, in any case, I'll make sure that that's it's working down there because that's something you need to be able to rely on, but... Uh, um, Obviously, I can't maintain everybody's individual computers, but if you are having issues on your computer specifically, I can take a look and uh, see what's going on. All right, so I think we did remove an index last time, right? And we had that working, so now we need to write... Um, well, let's just test this real quick. Now we need to write um, add at index, finish that up, and then we're moving on to... I had you read about stacks, right? All right, so let's just get a couple of things on here. All right, then we'll remove that index one. Let's rid of the two. Remove an index one, gets rid of the three. That should give us a toast. All right, and then remove, well, let's just switch it to remove an index. All right, so that guy seems to be doing what it's supposed to do. All right, so now let's uh, go ahead and write add an index to complete that guy, and then we'll start looking at stacks. So inside of our linked list, we'll go ahead and we'll write a public int add add index. And we'll go ahead and do the whole throws exception thingy. Okay. Um, now we're going to ask the same question as we asked before. If they're giving us a uh, illegal index, we'll go ahead and throw illegal index. So let's go ahead and do that. Use that same code we had before. So if we're dealing with the empty list, um, actually, if we're dealing with the empty list, adding at uh, an index is, is will actually be okay if we add at zero. So we can remove that empty list portion of that. But if the index is less than zero or the index is greater than or equal to uh, the count. Now, this gets a little uh, sketchy too. So maybe we actually want to deal with this as a special case. So if this dot head is equal to null and index is equal to zero, that means they want to, it's the empty list and they want to add to the front. So we'll go ahead and we're going to say um, we need a uh, value here too, right? If we're adding something, we need the payload that we're going to add. All right, so if we're adding an index, if it's currently the empty list and they want to add it at position zero, we'll go ahead and say this dot add front payload. Let that guy do the work. Else if, if we're in here, we know that either we have the, uh, well, now we can ask the same question we had before. Or if I'm still kicking here, I can ask if it's the empty list or index is less than zero, you gave us an illegal thing, uh, or index is greater than or equal to count. We wouldn't be here if we already did the add to the empty list. Does that make sense? So we can ask that full question that we asked before. Because this means that they tried to add to an illegal position. Else, we're going to go ahead and do the uh, uh, our stuff. Now, if we're here, we know... We are not adding at index zero, right? 
We already know that because we would have handled the index zero thing here. And we know that the index is a legal index. Those are the two pieces of information we know if we're inside that else. Okay, so we cleared this minefield and we also cleared this one. All right, so we know that we are not adding to the front and that we're adding to a real place. So then my next special case would be, are we adding to the end? So if index is equal to this dot, well, we could say this dot count minus one, which is the last legal place in it. Now, this is kind of a decision we could make. If you have something with length five, the last legal thing would be bucket four. If we want to add to the end, we actually would be adding to bucket five, right? So we would probably say if it's equal to the count, that means we want to add it to the end of the list. Then we would say this dot add end payload. Make sense? And if we wanted to, we could have this as an else if. So we could have done that here. And then thrown the else down here. So this is saying, if we should add to the front, add to the front. If it's an illegal position, throw an exception. If we should add to the end, add to the end. Else... We know that the index is a legal index. That is not the front or the end. Same logic, we just did it in the, you know, we moved the uh, if statement to a slightly different place. All right, should we add to the front? If yes, do it. Is the position you gave us an illegal position? If it is, throw an exception. Should we add to the end? If we're, if we're still kicking here, should we add to the end? Yes. Now, we do need to consider this guy, though. <clears throat> Since we're saying the index is greater than, e or greater than or equal to this dot count, and we're saying that makes it illegal, what we really want to say is if it's greater than this dot count plus one, because we're going to allow them to add it to this dot count. This dot count means add to the end. Okay, so if we're trying to add to the empty list, or you gave us a negative index, or and keep in mind that if we're trying to add to the empty list after we've already seen, did they want to add it to the empty list at bucket zero? We're going to allow that. Could you not just leave this dot count and then greater than greater than equal to? Well, we need it to be. Actually, no. You're actually right the way our count works, that's correct. So index is greater than this dot count is, is the correct thing. Um, because this dot count would be, for a thing that has five things in it, the last element would be five. So this dot count would be five and that we're, we'll allow that. But if it's greater than five, we wouldn't. So if we're, if we're here, we did not add it to the front. So we're saying, look, if it's the empty list, we're not gonna allow you to add it. If you gave us a negative index, we're not going to allow you to add it. If you gave us an index that's greater than the last index we'll allow, which is this dot count, we're not going to allow it. So we'll throw the exception in those cases. Otherwise, if you're trying to add it to the end, go ahead and we'll add it to the end. Otherwise, we must be adding it somewhere in the middle. This is the special, you know, this is the actual work of uh, um, added index. So go to our picture. All right, I'll just dump these things here real quick. All right, so let's say that we wanted to add an index one. So the thing that we are adding should become the new index one, okay? So let me uh, build my, a, a new node here. So we're gonna just do, I'll steal this guy. 
Well, and actually, those are memory addresses when we were still doing the memory address stuff. So I'll just steal this guy. So that's memory address 700. We're going to add a 13, let's say. That's the payload. And right now, this guy will point nowhere. And this is maybe a node called the N. So we'll go ahead and create that new node, the node we intend to add. So do that first. Node N is, node N is equal to new node payload. All right, so now that guy exists. Okay, so we just created this. Now, let's assume index in our case here was one. All right, so we want to add it at bucket one. We need to figure out how do we make it this guy. So we ultimately want this guy to point at whatever's currently in index one, right? And then we want the guy who currently points in index one to point to him. That's what we want to happen. All right, so if we do this in a couple of pieces, let's go ahead and run up to index one and set this guy's next node to that guy. For int i is equal to zero, i is less than index, i plus plus, we'll say, um, well, we can do this a couple of different ways. If we follow the pattern we've done before, we created like a, um, a node, cur node is equal to this dot head. And then inside here, we set cur node equal to cur node dot get next node. So that runs it to the position that we want it. Then we would say n dot set next node to cur node. So that's probably the easiest to understand version of this. The other thing you can do is you can avoid having cur node and you could have n's next node effectively be your cur node. So we would start off by saying n dot set next node to this dot head. And then as we went through here, we would say n dot set next node to n dot get next node dot get next node. It would kind of be funky looking but it would work. We would just kind of store those next nodes inside of n's next node temporarily. This is probably the cleaner version of this. So here we're saying, look, we're going to use the temporary node here, and we're going to go ahead and run up to bucket index. Once I'm at bucket index, I have that guy pointing at bucket index. I'll go ahead and let n know that that is his next node. Make sense? So when we're done with that, so effectively what we had is we had a, no, I'll just repurpose this since I don't have a pre node in here yet. So cur node starts off at this dot head. Since in our example index is one, well, the loop will go through one time. So cur node is going to be point to here. And then the very next line will say that n dot set next node to whatever cur node is. n dot set next node to whatever cur node is. Make sense how we got there? Okay, so now N is pointing to the right place, but he's not quite inserted yet because now what we need to do is we need to get the guy that came right before Kerr node. So the node that Kerr node used to point at, he needs to now point to N. So we probably would keep track of our Prev node. So node prev node will start off as null. Then inside here we'd say prev node is equal to cur node. So we'll preserve the current value of cur node. Then we'll change cur node to its own next node. So prev node will always drag one behind cur node. Make sense how that's going to work?
So if you if we look at the picture here, initially it looks like this. So, you know, Preve node is just kind of staring out into oblivion here. Starts off at null. Kerr node starts off at head. Once we go through the loop one time, the very first thing we do is we say Preve node equals the same thing Kerr node equals. Then we say Kerr node is equal to his own next node. So however many times we do that to get us up to index, notice that Preve node always drags one position behind Kerr node. Make sense? Now, we're safe to do this here because we know we're not adding to the front. Well, I can say we're adding to the end, but the front is the important part here. If we're in this else, we know we've already handled the add to the front thing. So we'll never have a situation where Preev node won't at least get to a real node. He'll always get to at least the head of the node. Because the earliest we're adding something to our list in here is to bucket one. Make sense? All right, so now we have the code that says Preve node always drags one behind Kerr node. So after we've gotten those things into position, we set n, next node, to point to the same thing Kerr node points to, and then we'll set Preve node's next node to point to n. Preve node, set next node to n. And at the end of this function, we know that this guy will be garbage collected, this guy will be garbage collected, so we don't need to worry about uh, those. There was, those were local variables to the, to the function, so we don't need to set those to null or anything. Um, and have we inserted it at the right place now? Seems like it. All right, so last thing to do is we just need to update our interface. We can steal our line from, um, let's just do a, where's add front? Let's steal our line from that. Further down? Oh, uh, I probably wrote that wrong. Remove return something. Yeah, this is void. I don't remember if I copied the function from down there or just was duplicating it, but yeah. Add something doesn't return anything. Okay, so where's my ads? There's ad front. So this is our update interface stuff. I'll just steal all that. We'll modify it as necessary. Um, well, what do you mean? Do we have a function that displays it? Well, we wrote a function called display that gives us like the text-based output oh, of the list. Excellent. Yeah, we're updating our actual visual interface. Now, we actually probably could and maybe probably should write a function that does this stuff generically. That way we can just call it instead of copying the same code over and over again. But uh, we're this far down the path and this is the last piece of this project. So this. <laughs> we're going to leave it. We've already decided that the interface stuff is more of just a... Uh, fluff for you know showing our program so uh so we'll go ahead and create a brand new text view we're going to set that text views text to the payload we'll set his gravity as a center just like we did for the other ones we're going to add that guy at index index so we'll let that link list container take um you know take charge of putting the you know the, the in the right place now imagine if we were doing this with a text-based interface, we'd have to kind of redraw the whole screen um, and you know insert it in the right place and redisplay. So you know, I think this might be easier at the end. And then we'll increment our count because we did add one more thing. Okay, so now let's go and hook this uh, whole added index dealy up to our button. So here's our added index. We'll go ahead and actually steal that logic. So we'll go ahead and grab our index from that index box. We will try to add an index. 
Uh, now we need to get our payload too. Yeah, this is kind of crappy written code anyway, so let me just steal that part of it. So int payload is equal to integer dot parsent. We'll pass it new number et dot get string. All right, so that's the integer version of our payload. So we'll pass that along with the index to add it index. So this guy is going to try to add it at index. Something bad happens. We'll catch the exception. We'll make toast. She's a little. She's at least a little cheered up now. She's, she lost the Android Studio fight. She's a little down. Is it, this isn't the new laptop yet. Have you decided on a new laptop yet? We can look at what's in there. I think that might be more trouble than it's worth. But we can look. Um, so we'll go ahead and give our error message. Otherwise, we're going to add an index. We'll add the payload. We'll add the, at the index. It should go do all the jazz we just wrote, whether that means add front or add end, if we call those right things, or we do the whole surgery ourselves. This should update the interface all internally. All right, so let's add a one at index zero. So there's our one. Let's add a two. Oh, we're not clearing out the boxes here, uh, but that's all right. We'll add a two at index one. That's a two at the end. So that's our add front, add end proxies. All right, then let's add a three at index one. So this should put it between the one and the two. So there's the, the three. Um, if we add another, well, let's do a four at index one. This should put it between the one and the three. If we add it at index, let's add a five at index two. This should put it zero, one, two. This should put it between the four and the three. There should be a five. Yep, so it seems to be working. We've exhaustively tested it for all possible inputs. Uh, oh, well, we can here try to add it in a negative one. Oh, it's, I didn't allow it to be assigned. Uh, here, so we'll, we'll add it to bucket 13. So there's our illegal index. Yeah, we technically, we don't even allow them to add it at a negative number. That's okay. We don't need to change it. That way we just prevent that error, <laughs> right? We won't even let them put it in a negative index because it would never make sense. Okay, so I think that completes that whole rigmarole. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns about that guy? What's the use of linked lists? Okay, well, so two things. The first thing would be if uh, whenever you would use an array, but you don't know how many elements you need to store, and speed isn't the utmost concern, linked lists allow you to store arbitrary amounts of data. You can store zero things, you can store 300 things, then you can back off and store 100 things and not waste any memory. So that's the generic use of a linked list. Then linked lists also act as the basis for the next two data structures we're going to look at. We're going to look at stacks starting now. And stacks are a linked data structure. All right, so they are kind of a subset of linked lists. Oh, no, we got to keep writing it ourselves. Well, no, no, I'm just saying we're going to write stacks. Yeah. But for the linked list, it's yeah, not yet. We're gonna write. We're gonna write. We're gonna write stacks from scratch. Yeah, I understand that, but we're not gonna. We're not gonna use any of these functions. Well, we will, but we're gonna write them again. Okay. To for practice. 
But the but the good thing is. It's nice to see the actions that are implemented one, so just to be aware of it. Oh, and we will. I'll show you. I'll show you the implemented link list, the one that's built into the language. Yeah. Yeah. It, but they're so easy to use. It's because all the under the hood stuff's hidden from you. Okay. When you say add at bucket zero, it just magically adds at bucket zero. You don't care how it happened. Yeah. Um, well, but stacks are already focused. Okay. Because stacks, I, we'll start talking about it here in a second. But for instance, the easiest functions we wrote was uh, add front and remove front, right? That's two. That's that's actually all stacks are. Stacks have push and pop and peak, and peak is like an extraneous thing. When you push something onto a stack, you add it to the front of the stack. When you pop something off a stack, you remove it from the front of the stack. Those are the two easiest linked list functions we wrote, right? Add front, remove front. That's all a stack is. So it's not like we're you know now it's more about using the stack in terms of pushes and pops. Um, what we're going to be focusing on because we're going to write the stack in like no time. Okay, so let me push this. Commit changes. No, I guess I technically wrote the, or let's say, uh, remove at index. Even though that's backwards, I just put the wrong commit message last time. Commit and push. Okay, so now you have the updated version up on GitHub. So let's go ahead and close this, start a new project. Hmm? What, you get to start a brand new one? The brand new interface? Last week. Two weeks ago? Oh, well, yeah. So, so, so we had to do everything in linked lists. The good news is we'll be starting a new project next class, too. Because I can't, the first assignment I'm going to give you for stacks is just too easy. You won't think it's easy. You won't like it. So we're going <laughs> so to call this guy... Uh, Towers of Hanoi, um, CSC 300 Spring 2018. You can name yours, whatever, but huh? H A N O I. Tower of Hanoi. All right, go ahead and hit next. Next. Empty. Where's my empty activity? Oh, it's already selected. We'll go ahead and let it create the default stuff, main activity. All right, so for starters, let me show you what we're going to build. Because you're going to want to start thinking about the interface in your head because I'm actually going to have you implement the interface for this. All right, here. This is Towers of Hanoi. And we're going to implement the simple version of it. So you have three towers. Uh, each of these towers is going to be a stack. Okay, and that'll make sense here in a few minutes. Uh, and you all read about stacks. So you know that stacks have pop, where we move to the top, and they have push, where you add to the top. Okay. Our goal here is to get all of these disks from this left tower to this right tower. Now, the rules associated with Towers of Hanoi is you are not allowed to put a larger disk on top of a smaller one. So if I move this small disk from tower 0 to tower 1, and then I try to move the next disk, so I pop off of tower 0, and I try to push onto tower 1, it'll fail. Because you're not allowed to put this larger disk on top of the smaller one. So I would be allowed to do that. Then I would be allowed to do that. Pop. If I try to push here, it'll fail. Pop, push, pop, push, pop, push. Starting to see the pattern. Okay, so I'm going to restart this and show you how this guy actually works. So the efficient way of doing this would be we'll pop, we'll push, we'll pop, 
push, pop, push, pop, push, pop, push, pop, push, pop, push. That's just gameplay. So you're going to have little buttons that say, you know, above each stack, it says pop. And that'll be like a little placeholder thing. And then you'll say push it to one of the other uh, two stacks. And it's either going to be allowed to be pushed or not. You're going to be making this game. Yeah. But you'll be making the simple version of it just like this. Because you notice here, they have a thing where you can make the number of disks go up and make it a lot more difficult. Yours doesn't have to do that. Yours has three disks. Okay. Same exact thing. You just you have to do it more times. <laughs> uh, there's also versions where you get more towers. Yeah. So I think uh, you know there's some some site that will allow you to you know basically create as many. I'm sure there's some limit, but hundreds and hundreds of disks, and you can have hundreds and hundreds of towers. Um. But you want those need to be rel rel relative to each other. So the, the fewer towers you have and the more disks you have, the harder it is. If you have a million towers and you have 50 disks, it's not all that hard. <laughs> you just line them up <laughs> and, and then, you know, pile them back in the right order at the end. Okay. So you have an idea how the, the game works? All right, so I used to play this game professionally. World champ, no. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a kid's a kid's toy thing. Um, okay, so first thing we need to do is we need to build our stack. Okay, now I'm going to name our stack just to get you started here something a little different. Okay, it's not going to be called a stack; it's going to be called a tower. So it'll help you on the assignment, right? Because these guys right here, these act as stacks, correct? So we're going to be building a stack data structure, but it's going to be called a tower. Um, you know, actually, we could build a generic. Now, let me do let me give you the, the tower. It'll make your life a little easier. All right, so we're going to go into the package here. I'm going to right click. We're going to create a new Java class. Um, actually, let's start off with, um, well, we're going to have to make both of them. I'm going to create a class called a disk. Go ahead and create that. And then I'm going to also create a class called a tower. All right, and if we look at our game over here, we have towers and we have disks. And towers are collections of disks, and those collections work by the rules of the stack data structure with a little bit of extra on there. Because stacks, but generic stacks say, whatever, when you push something, it just goes to the top of the stack. It doesn't matter what it was. Our rules say, you're not always allowed to push it to the top. Only if it's a legal push. Even only if the top of the stack currently has something on it that's larger than the thing you're currently trying to push on. Make sense? So, but initially here, we're going to build uh, our tower uh, generically as a generic stack, and then you could upgrade it to support the Towers of Hanoi logic. All right, so for our disk, go ahead and open up disk here too. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and instead of naming it payload, we're going to name we're going to name it size. So I'm going to have a private int size public disk int size this dot size is equal to size. Um no, the tower is going to know what disks are on it. But a disk needs to know about the next disk. Because this goes back to what you asked before. That So disks are like our nodes from linked lists. All right. So this guy is going to, we're implementing a stack in terms of, it's a linked data structure. It's like a linked list. It's just a special case linked list. It's a simpler linked list because it only has add front, remove front. 
Those are the only two functions it has. We just happen to call them push and pop. Add front, remove front. Make sense? All right, so this guy's also going to need to know about private disk next disk. Oh, sorry. So when this guy first into comes into, uh, into existence, we'll say this dot next disk is equal to null. All right, now we're gonna need to give ourselves a getter and a setter for uh, next disk, and probably a getter for size. So let's right click here. Generate. Getter and setter for that guy. So there's our get next disk and our set next disk. And then we'll generate a getter for size. All right, so there's our disk stuff. All right. Now, as a hint, what you might want to do in your assignment is you might want to teach disks how to display themselves. So, for instance, within the disk data structure here, you might want to store probably like a um, uh, maybe a text view version of the disk. Maybe that guy has like uh, if it's one if it's size one, it maybe has uh, two equal signs in it. If it's size two, it has four. If it's size three, it has you know six, something like that. You know, just to kind of differentiate them. If you want to get a little fancier with it, you could maybe make them um, buttons instead and change the background color of the buttons so it looks more like this. And then you can have it uh, set the size of the buttons just to be some shorter, some longer, so they kind of look more like disks. I don't care. Make your interface as simple as you want. You know, just. If you decide you want to go with color-y stuff, you can. Otherwise, just three text views will be fine with some number of equal signs in them. And then those guys will move around with the disks. Okay? So that's one uh, hint. Another hint I'll give you um, is, uh, and this is more of a warning, a view group, well, a view cannot exist in more than one view group at a time. So in order to take a disk from this tower to this tower, we have to fully remove it from this tower. Then we need to fully add it to this tower. So you can't do this. You can't say, um, you can't say this disk push onto this tower before you've popped it off of this tower first. You, you got to do it in the right order, otherwise it, your program will crash. Because well, there's a place for it. my suggestion is you give a, like a little, you know, a little view group up here, okay, a little, a uh, little place to put that that guy. You pop him off, you put him there, and then you hit a button and he comes off of there, and you put him on here. You give yourself an inter intermediate thing, especially considering you have to insert some logic in between, right? You're always allowed to remove a disk from a tower. But when you go to try to push it onto a different tower, that might not be allowed, depending on what's currently at the top of that tower. Make sense? Okay. So that's going to be our disk. Now we'll go over to tower. All right. So um, for tower, we're going to keep track of the top of the tower. That's kind of like the head of the link list. But top is actually the thing you would use for a stack. You know, so a tower has a top, a stack has a top. All right, so we'll have a private disk top. You might find it helpful to keep track of a count of the number of things on your tower as well, just like we did with link lists. Um, depending on how you implement it, that might be helpful. It's not required. You can certainly do it without that, but uh, I want you to go through the problem solving process for this. So we'll say public tower. We'll say this dot top is equal to null because initially towers are empty, right? All right. Now, when something gets added to a tower, we 
push it onto the tower. And what kind of somethings do our towers hold? Holds disks, right. So we're going to have a public. Um, I'm going to make it void initially, but you might decide maybe you want to make it be a Boolean. Because maybe this guy is the dude who determines whether it was allowed. You can decide whether you want the push function for the tower to reject disks that weren't uh, appropriately placed. Uh, or are you going to check beforehand? You know, you get to choose. It's the same thing, same logic. You're just deciding, do I want the logic beforehand or do I want, the, do I want to always just kind of try to push the disk onto the tower and then let the tower reject it if it's an inappropriate move? You can choose. So I'll make this void first. So public void. Um, we're going to call this guy push. And he's going to take a disk as a parameter. And this is equivalent to add front for a length list. Now we're not going to write any of the special logic in here. You'll have to do that for your assignment. But so I'm just going to add it to the front, just like we did with linked lists. So I'll say if this dot top is equal to null, and we say this dot top is equal to D, right? If I had the empty list, the new top, and the new top of the well, if I had the empty stack, the empty tower, the new top of the tower is this disk. Else, I didn't have the empty tower, <laughs> and if I didn't have the empty tower, I need my new disk to point to the same place the top points to. So d dot set next disk to this dot top. And then I can say this dot top is equal to D. So make D point to the same place that top points to, to preserve that pointer, then make top point to D. Make sense? So that's push. Or if you incognito, this is add front from our link list. Good. Yeah, you want to. So another hint. Let's kick this back down to the normal. When you first start your game, you're going to have three towers like this. So in on create, create a tower zero, a tower one, a tower two. You'll also create a disk zero, disk one, disk two, or whatever you want to call the disks then go ahead and add them to tower zero. So inside of onCreate, you'll instantiate three towers, and then you'll instantiate three disks, and then you'll go ahead to start the game off. You'll push the three disks in the appropriate order onto tower zero. That sets your game up so it's ready to start working, right? Because those towers start off in the far left, uh, the disks rather, start off in the far left tower. Make sense? That's your that's your setup. And this guy, so here are more hints. This tower, probably you want to have a vertical linear layout associated with it. So he's gonna have a view group, he's gonna have a view group, he's gonna have a view group, and then these three towers maybe live in a horizontal linear layout. So you have a vertical linear layout, so you have one big horizontal linear layout. And inside it, you have three vertical linear layouts. One for the first tower, one for the second tower, one for the third tower. And each of those vertical linear layouts will hold, depending on how you want to represent your disks, text views or um, uh, buttons, whatever. Now, uh, what's nice here, and this is where you might do the, the, the little trick, if you want to make it look a little prettier, we know exactly how many disks will ever exist in our towers, right? Because it's three. That's the game we're making. So in our linked list, we were dynamically generating text views. Whenever somebody added a new node to the list, we added a five to the front. In code, we created a brand new text view using the context. Then we added that text view at bucket whatever to our, uh, our uh, view group, right? 
Well, since you already know the nature of what your board's going to look like, why not just use the interface builder to build your three disks and then connect those three, whether it's buttons or text views or whatever, to your, um, uh, to your disks that you create and then just make sure that you've added them to the first tower so that your tower data structure and what your screen currently looks like match up. Otherwise, if you just visually made the three disks on the first tower, but you never actually add them to the first tower over here, they won't, they won't look right. Does that make sense? So you can control how your disks, well, you could even use images if you wanted to. You can control how your disks look uh, here if you design them in the interface builder and not dynamically create them. Then you'll have full control over what they look like. Make sense? That'll make life a little easier for you as well. All right, so this is push. Pop is going to return a disk. Uh, here's a hint related to this one. What you might do, um, depending on how you implement your pushes and pops, um, you might either ask is there something on the tower first before you ever call pop and then you know pop will always give you a real disk or another way you could do it is you can say you can try to pop you wouldn't actually use a try catch because we don't want to necessarily have exceptions here or you i mean you could if you want to write it that way but you could always call pop on it but if it gives you a null value meaning there wasn't anything in the in the tower then it would you know you would just treat null as oh it was the empty tower so you know, more than one way of accomplishing the same logic. Make sense? Um, I'm going to put another function in here. Well, actually, we'll put that function in right now. Now, this isn't officially part of the definition of a stack. Uh, did the book talk about peak as well? Or just talk about push and pop? All right, so a popular function for stacks that I think every stack should have, but it's not actually part of the official whatever stack data structure, is something called peak. And all that guy does is show you the top of the stack. Uh, no, it's more like the mountain peak would be P-E-A-K, right? So peak is like, you know, you're just peaking at this at the top of the stack. Because this guy does not this guy does not remove the top element of the stack. It's not actually leaving the stack. You're just getting a glimpse at it. To see if you want it. Does that make sense? You can look at the top of a stack and say, okay, yeah, there's there's a disk there. Okay, now I can safely pop that. Something like that. So that's a little convenience function. I mean, it doesn't do anything, really, right? It just, it's basically a getter for this dot top. <laughs> but peak is a, is a very common function for stacks that allow you to just get a quick glimpse at the top of the stack without changing the stack at all. So would you use peak then if you're like looking to push a disk on top of it? Possibly, yeah. So, I mean, there's multiple ways you could pull it off, but that would be a good one. You might say, okay, I have this disk. Is that, is that a good landing zone for this guy? So you would peek at that and say, okay, yeah, this guy's allowed to go on top of that one, so I can now push it. So it all depends where you want to put your, your policing logic. Do you want to have the policing logic at kind of the game level, where before you are allowed to make a move, you check to make sure it's legal? Or do you build the policing logic into the towers themselves, where you just say, oh, I got this, you stick it in there, and he might spit it back out to you. You know, it's like, it's like oh, well, that didn't work. <laughs> It's going to solve the same problem. You just decide which way you do it. Okay. Uh, now, another thing I'll point out here, because, uh, you, know, you know, I say things like that that sound kind of jokey. That's the way I think about programming while I'm programming. I mean, that's the way you solve the problem. So we're just being, you know, uh, you know problem-solving people. And I might think about it like, well, if I want that logic to be in the tower, I have this disk. I'm going to try to push it in there. And he might spit it back out. That means he didn't want it. That would be the real way of thinking about it. You know, I'm not just saying it to be funny. It's funny anyways, because I'm hilarious. Okay. 
But that's the way I actually do think about it because we're just working through that problem. All right, so that's peak. Pop is going to return the disk that is at the top of the uh, uh, tower, but he's also going to disconnect it from the top of the tower. This is remove front. Make sense? All right. So we're going to say disk, disk to remove is equal to this dot top. And that's either just going to be, I mean, if we have the empty, the empty tower, we'll just return that. But so we'll just ask a question here. Do I need to do some extra, extra housekeeping before we just return him? Do I need to do some disconnecting? So we'll say if disk to remove is not equal to null. If he's a real disk, I need to go ahead and disconnect him from the next disk. He might be the only disk. So actually, I might be wasting my time here, but I'll just do it anyway. So I'll say disk to remove dot set next disk to null. Now, I can't just directly do that. Before I do that, I need to say this dot top is equal to disk to remove dot get next disk. So I'll, I already have a pointer to the top called disk to remove. Now I can safely change what top points to. Top now points to the second disk in the list, which could be null if there was only one disk in there, but he points to the next disk. Then I can safely set disk to removes next disk to null, which fully disconnects him from the tower. But I only did that if I actually had a real disk there. I didn't just grab thin air. So anyway, you cut it. When we're done here, I'm going to return disk to remove. That's what I found at the top of the, of the tower. So that's the disk I'm going to return. I might be returning a null value where he's not actually a disk. But I did the appropriate disconnecting if it made sense. That makes sense? All right, so there's push, pop, and peak for your, uh, for your towers. And there's your disk. So you're going to want to um, create the towers of Hanoi game. Now I'm going to give you a suggested uh, interface for this guy. So I'm going to open up my interface, and you can deviate from this all you want if uh, you don't uh, like this guy. All right, so I'll get rid of the hello world thing. I'll go ahead, and I'm going to throw in a vertical linear layout that fills the parent. Okay. Now what I want to have is we're going to have uh, some buttons in here. So we're going to have a couple of different things. I want to have a... Um, Probably a placeholder um, horizontal linear layout up here. And that's going to be the guy that like temporarily holds a disk. So we're going to do a horizontal linear layout up here. And I'm going to have his height wrap content. Um, now, just for the moment, I'll go ahead and put a little placeholder in there just so you kind of know what he's for. You'll want to delete this when you go and do it. So we'll do it as a button. So that's going to be a placeholder for a disk. When we, when we pop a disk off a tower, maybe we throw it there so that we can then push it onto a different tower. Does that make sense? All right. Now I want to put a another horizontal linear layout in here. And this guy is going to hold my um, buttons for push pop. Now I'm going to suggest you just have three buttons. <clears throat> and what you do is once you push, you change the text on the button. So, or when I pop. So when I hit on tower zero, for instance, I hit pop and it loads that disc into the landing zone. All the buttons then turn to say push. Because that's my next move. A pop is always followed by a push. You might choose to push it right back onto the tower you just took it off of. 
That makes sense? So you have three buttons and they alternate what their functionality is as well as what their text is. They're either acting as a pop button or they're acting as a push button. So I'll go ahead and add three buttons onto here. There's one. There's two. There's three. And I'll have them default. So I'll say pop. That one says copy for some reason. All right, so they're all pop by default. All right, and I'm gonna change that horizontal linear layout's height to wrap content. Now you're probably going to wanna change the names of these buttons. So probably this is the tower one button. Maybe this is tower two button. Or actually, if you want to name it, I'm going to call this guy Tower 1 button. I'll name this guy Tower 0 button. Just if you want to keep your naming conventions, you know, base 0 based. And this will be Tower 3 button. Okay. So that's that linear layout. Was I screwed up? Sorry. This is Tower 3. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. See, I was just testing you. All right, so there's that guy. So that's wrapping those buttons. Now I want my three towers down here, right? So I'll go ahead. I'm going to make that a horizontal linear layout. And then I'll put vertical linear layouts inside of there. So I'll go ahead and add a horizontal linear layout in here. And then I'll go ahead and add a vertical linear layout. And I'm gonna set that guy's width to, uh, so let me do percent there. I think this would be like 50 dp. Oh. All right, just for the second, I'm going to say wrap content. Yeah, there's a way of doing it. So I'll wrap content there, and then I'll have my third one. This is just getting them in the right place. I'll wrap content there. Now in this very first tower, so this is uh. Um, this is going to be tower zero, tower one, tower two. So this is tower zero. This is tower one. This is tower two. And then in tower zero, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put, I'm just going to represent my disks as buttons. So I'll go to my widgets. Throw a button, throw another button, throw another button. I'm gonna set the gravity on this guy to bottom. Suck the disc down to the bottom. And let's call this guy disc zero. Disk one, disk two, and then you can change the color. I think it's the background color of the disk. Well, you can mess with that, but just for the sake of time here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change the text there to two equal signs for six. So there's our, our three disks. Um, now, there is a way. Let's see if I can figure this out real quick for maybe it's at 
this level. You said which one? The, the overall, the this guy, you said his weight to 100%? Yeah. And then I think he well, it's still going to do that. Maybe you set it to none? No, something like that. I really thought you could do 33% here. Oh well. Kind of unimportant. If you just have to make it wrap content, that's fine. This is more just getting it perfectly split across the three. All right, so that gives you kind of a starting point for your interface. Make sense? There is a way to get those guys split across it. It's not very hard. I just don't remember what the little trick is to do it. All right, so I'll go ahead and push this. I'll put the uh, link to the uh, um, uh, GitHub repository up on uh, the homework, and it'll be due on Tuesday, a working Towers of Illinois. Sound good? All right. I will see everybody on Tuesday. There's two. Supposed to meet for a second? Yeah.